Welcome to this Bon uh, video on the myth of expert witness objectivity and I'm delighted to have Dr. Ityol Draw with me today. Uh, welcome. Ityol, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself? I study human behavior. In fact, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, which means in plain English, I study the brain and cognitive architecture. How do people perceive information how they make judgment, interpretation, and decision making. And speci specifically, I specialize in experts. So experts who are highly trained, motivated, and competent, when do they make mistakes? When are they not objective? When are they vulnerable to bias? As I like to say, why smart people do stupid things? So I come from a cognitive perspective, understanding the human brain, and looking at human behavior and human performance. So Silly question, what does cognitive mean? Cognitive means is the way we memorize information, the way we process information, how we see things, how we interpret them, how we make judgment. You have the physical part of us, and then you have your cognitive part, it's what's in here. What well, the interpretation of reality? The interpretation, the judgment you make, uh, the opinions, an expert the opinions the decisions you make, the conclusion, how do you perceive it, how do you make observations, how do you draw conclusions, all of these are cognitive processes. Now I think uh, you very kindly sent me two very interesting articles from one the Journal of Science and Justice and one the Journal of Applied Research in Memory and Cognition. And I think a lot of the points you're making are in these two articles, although you've written many articles, I think, about this. Yes, I've picked two out of over 100. The first one from Science and Justice is very short. It's two pages. If you want to have a very concise, without too many detail, the other one is a bit more elaborate if you want to see some more of the detail. OK, well, let's get down to the, the basics. How does your work apply to expert witnesses? Well, experts are supposed to be impartial, sure. and experts believe they're impartial and objective. However, in reality, experts are far from impartial and far from being objective. And of course, I'm not accusing them of intentionally. They really want to do their job to be objective, but uh, there's no objectivity. But why are they like that? Why do you suggest this? Because of the way that it's not me suggesting, it's the way the human brain works and how we use information. So experts, in most cases, are exposed to a lot of information. Sure. We brief the experts, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. They know irrelevant information about the case. And I'm even talking about the more objective scientific evidence, and I elaborate in detail in the article, but fingerprint experts, DNA experts, have misinterpretation and bias in their interpretation of the DNA and fingerprint evidence and can draw wrong conclusion because of the bias, because of how they interpret in the judgment, which they're swayed away by relevant and irrelevant information. So sometimes, just, and I know I can talk for a long time, sometimes, for example, they walk from the suspect to the evidence, not from the evidence to the suspect. So the human mind is very flexible. It's like the Roman, you know, archery, bow and arrow, they shoot the arrow, and then they draw the target, always bullseye. <laughs> so we do backward reasoning, we, we rationalize. So there are a lot of elements that the experts present themselves to the court, and we ne need to learn how to identify when experts are biased and how to minimize it. Just picking up one point now, are you saying that the way the lawyers instruct the experts can affect the outcome of the opinion? It affects the cognitive processing, the way they approach the information, how they see the information most definitely. So the, the amount <coughs> of information that's given to them with the instructions can make a difference? Are you they, saying that? They do. How much a difference it makes, how much information they're giving, what information, is it relevant or irrelevant information, it always, the way the, the human mind is not a camera. We don't take information passively. We don't have an on-off button. The brain uses any information it has. So how they're instructed is one thing. There's a whole range of factors that affect expert perception, judgment, and decision-making, which takes them away from focusing on the evidence itself, seeing it, and judging it objectively. So they're biased. How much bias there is, 
Does the bias lead them to a wrong conclusion? It depends on a case by case. So even if they're affected, it doesn't mean they reach a wrong conclusion. They may or may not have done so, but there is the miss of objectivity. Experts are required by law and present themselves and actually believe that they're objective, but that is not the case. Well, if, if that's true, what can they do about it? And what can solicitors do about it if you're saying even the instructions make a difference? Okay, there are a few things. Uh, first of all, we need to identify it if and when it exists. So For acknowledge it exists? Yes, acknowledge it generally, but in a specific criminal or legal case, they may have not been cognitive bias, they may have, it depends on the circumstances. So we need to learn to be sensitive, to identify it, and we can manage context, how the solicitors present the information is only one part of it. There's a lot of information. What did the police tell the expert? What did the expert go? Did they come with expectations before they even look at the evidence? We have a procedure called LSU, Linear Sequential Unmasking, that goes to detail how you present the context to the expert and how you manage the context in which you look at the evidence. And in the UK, for example, the forensic regulator has now issued guidance on cognitive bias and how to minimize it. And in the US and Australia and the Netherlands, it's worldwide changed. Ten years ago, it this didn't exist. didn't exist, and now this is a very big and hot topic. Is a similar, perhaps a parallel would be the way you interview a witness, a normal witness, a witness of fact, the way the questions you put, are your suggestions? Absolutely. You but the legal system is very much aware that witnesses, eyewitnesses, oh, are, are not very reliable. They got involved, they may have been a victim, they saw it, they're lay people. But the experts come in, the medical experts. So this the is why you call it a myth of expert. Exactly. See, um, and then you have accountants and doctors yeah. and lawyers and uh, medical doctors and forensic examiners and scientists and statisticians. They all come to the court and the court, the, ju the judge and the jury believe the objective. I'm a scientist. I'm doing it for 20 years. But this is a very hot topic. Recently, the senior judiciary in the UK invited me to give a workshop to the judges, you know, the right. High Court and Supreme Court and Court of Appeal judges. And I trained them on that and they were surprised themselves about and this. They, so, so it sounds like the first point to tell is acknowledging that experts can have this lack of objectivity. Mm -hmm. So they notice that, then get down to the specifics in terms of the way they use the methodology to examine the facts of the case, yes. how they come to their conclusion. Yes, and, and you can also the judiciary needs to be aware of this. Absolutely, the judiciary on the top, the experts, I don't want to say on the bottom, and in the middle, the lawyers and the barristers, because that's something that comes, should and is starting to come up in court when they cross-examine the experts. What did you know? What were you told? When you looked at the evidence, did you have an expectation? Did they give you this information? So you're starting to understand. And in fact, it has come up in the UK court. Initially, of course, the other side didn't want the issue of bias to come up. And they said, if you don't agree with my expert, it was a CCTV expert, but it's irrelevant, bring another CCTV expert to rebut them, why okay. you bring a cognitive scientist to talk about expert bias, you know, they don't understand DNA or the medical. And there was a, di a discussion in the high court and the high court ruled yes. And they said it's never happened before, but now it's happened. And this expert was you, was it? Uh, it was me, but it can be any cognitive expert because when you learn as an undergraduate student, introduction to psychology 101 that the human mind is not objective it's right. not a it's not a simple camera people don't take information including experts highly trained competent i'm not uh, suggesting that experts intentionally distort or bias the evidence but how they see it how they interpret it is affected by a whole range of factors and biases and they're subjective and vulnerable to bias and can and do sometimes reach wrong conclusions. And this, of course, could be revealed in cross-examination or even questioning by the judge, couldn't it? Absolutely. The judges start asking cross-examination. Also, the procedures. Now, when it went to court for the first time in the high court, then the experts kind of said, what are you talking about? 
Now, if they don't follow some of the procedures to minimize cognitive bias, they are violating the guidance of the forensic regulator, for example. Now it's known. Now they get training in that. So rather than being kind of something new, now the standard has changed and they need to follow procedures. And the lawyers in cross-examination, regardless which side they're on, need to raise the issue and start asking, you know, when you made the decision, what about bias? Okay, so just a final thought here. What do experts need to know, need to do now these implications are out? And the same with lawyers and judges. What's, what's I can tell you as an expert I, what I've done, and I've been uh, commissioned by the prosecution and by the defense in the UK, in the US, in, in a number of countries. From the beginning, I say, give me only the information I need to know so about less the is case. More. Less is more. You want to get everything you need. But if I'm looking, for example, in a murder case I was involved in, they wanted me to look at a piece of evidence, whether the examiner, the expert, was objective or they were biased. And they wanted to give me all the information about the case. I don't want to know if this is the only piece of evidence. Because that could affect your bias. It will affect me. It will affect how I approach it. I don't want to know if there's other evidence against the suspect or not. I want to have kind of focusing on the relevant information, so I don't come with any expectations, anything to prove. I look at it as much as possible, tabula rather objective, and knowledge is power, but knowledge also contaminates. So we need as experts the knowledge that is relevant, but if you interview and talk to experts, almost in all the cases, the experts are exposed, intentionally or not, to a lot of irrelevant information that affects their expectations. Many of them know what they're expected to find. Not that they try to find it, but that affects their cognitive processes. So you want to be like the emperor's new clothes. You know, the kid, oh, the emperor has no clothes on. And that's a kid that hasn't been contaminated by everyone thinking the something. Yeah. Exactly. So you want to be almost like a kid with no prior knowledge accept what you need in your expertise when you look at uh, the evidence. So that's very important for the experts to do and for the judges and for the barristers and lawyers to cross-examine, to raise it in court. And now there's professional guidelines all over the world to experts how to minimize cognitive bias, to focus only on the relevant information, to work from the evidence to the suspect, not backward, and a lot of other details that we can sit here for many hours and talk about. Well, Leslie, well, thank you so much. Um, well, there's a lot of implications there, and um, I do invite you to read the two journal articles and, uh, and see ETL's website. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you.